did Aaron Nola take less money to go back to the Phillies? And what does this mean for the Cardinals? Well, let's talk about it. What's going on, everybody, and welcome in. Brendan Schaefer here talking some St. Louis Cardinals news with you on this Sunday, November 19th, 2023. Didn't introduce this as a B-Shafe Daily podcast because it won't be. We're going to just do a quick video talking about Aaron Nola signing with the Philadelphia Phillies. That is a report that is out Sunday. I believe Bob Nightingale was the first one to have it. Others in the national reporting realm have chimed in. Here's the tweet from Bob. The Phillies and Aaron Nola have now reached a tentative agreement on a seven-year contract worth $170 to $175 million. Bob adds that Nola is undergoing a physical today before the deal becomes official. Talks between the Phillies and agent Joe Longo picked up steam in the last two days. That's from Bob Nightingale. And as we know, the St. Louis Cardinals were involved as well in chasing Aaron Nola, one of the top pitchers in this free agent market. We know the Cardinals have the intention on spending in free agency to pick up some starting pitching. They might even trade for one. And Aaron Nola was a name near the top of the list in terms of guys that the Cardinals had obvious interest in because of the skill set that he brings to the table, the workhorse nature of him as a pitcher. He gets you innings, 193 innings this last season for Philadelphia. And that was actually down from the year before where he threw 205 innings. He has eclipsed 200 innings, three different times in his major league career. The ERA was up a bit in 2023 for Nola, had a 4.46 ERA compared to a 3.25 ERA in 2022 and a 3.72 lifetime ERA across nine big league seasons. But he's one of those guys that strikes out more than a batter per inning, 202 Ks and 193 innings this year. The previous season, he had 235 strikeouts in 205 innings. Five different seasons now in his major league career with more than 200 strikeouts would have been a perfect workhorse to plop atop the Cardinals starting rotation. But guess what? It's not going to happen because he's heading back to Philadelphia. Now that that deal has happened and we live in a reality where Aaron Nola is off the board, doesn't it feel like in retrospect that this was always going to be the case? Like if you really boil it down and think about it, why would Aaron Nola leave the Phillies if they're offering him a fair contract? And... Honestly, why would the Phillies ever allow it to happen? I think at the end of the day, when we look back on Aaron Nola and the talks that he had with other teams, we can deduce that those were basically just market-setting endeavors where get an idea for what other teams are offering, get something similar from the Phillies, even if it's not the most money that he received. And if that's the case, you essentially are going to have to offer so far above and beyond what a player ends up signing for on what could be perceived perhaps as a hometown discount in order to convince that player to play for a team that he'd rather not play for, or he would not prefer to play for when stacked up against the place that he's been for his entire career. And I think that's what happened here with the Phillies and the Cardinals. And again, I've done podcasts talking about the fact that it really doesn't matter how you do it this offseason. If you're the St. Louis Cardinals, you just have to get it done and find the answers for your starting rotation. And that includes potentially overspending and overpaying on a guy to convince him to sign on your dotted line instead of somebody else's. But in this case, it's the first domino to fall of the free agency period in terms of the top flight starting pitchers. And I don't believe Yoshinobu Yamamoto has even been posted yet. That's supposed to come on Monday, if I'm not mistaken. So there, there are opportunities that exist still for the St. Louis Cardinals. This is one, though, that would have been really simple, right? It would have been really easy to give this guy a couple hundred million dollars and say, good, you're 30, 31 years old. You are our anchor for the next six or seven years atop the starting rotation. Pencil him in for 200 strikeouts. Pencil him in for 190 innings. Barring an injury, that's probably what you're going to get on an annual basis from Aaron Nola and done. Now we don't have to worry about the ace of the equation. Well, It would have been nice, but ultimately I think it would have been uh, just a little simpler than it's ultimately going to be for the Cardinals. Uh, I'm reading a tweet here from Jeff Jones, who had been listening evidently to KMOX and said that John Mozeliak told Tom Ackerman this morning on KMOX that Aaron Nola's agents called this morning to give them a heads up and that the conversation made it clear that the player wanted to go back to Philly 
And then Jeff adds a comment that I think is important to remember. He says the number required for tango is more than one. Takes two to tango, right? And clearly there were some cursory dancing with the Cardinals going on where they had those conversations. But at the end of the day, the impression seemed to be he wants to go back. Now, whether that means the agent told Mose like, hey, to get this deal done, you're going to have to give us, you know, seven years, 210. I don't know exactly how the conversation went with the agent saying, yeah, you know, player wants to be in Philly. Does that mean player wants to be in Philly? I'm the player's agent. So if you want him to be in St. Louis, give me an offer that I can give to this player that's going to convince him he doesn't want to be in Philly. And, and what would that number be? And if you're the Cardinals, that's a hard it's a hard deal to make, especially here at the beginning of the free agent period when there are other opportunities. Now, you can't allow every single player that comes through to end up with the same result, but I think right now there are enough of the pitchers remaining on the market, right? Like Aaron Nola is the first domino to fall. As long as you are on top of what the pivot points are and the alternate plans can be, I think the Cardinals are in a spot to where they can say, all right, we gave it our due diligence, we did what we could, on Aaron Nola, reality is I don't think he was going anywhere else unless you vastly overpaid. And does that put you in a bind that you really don't want to be in if you're the St. Louis Cardinals or any other team for that matter? If a player wants to be in a certain location, you cannot force a player against his will to go somewhere else. It sucks. I think he would have been a really great fit for the Cardinals because, again, that combination of innings, which we know the Cardinals are chasing volume of innings that I think Aaron Nola would have provided, but also the type of innings that you're getting from him in terms of the strikeout rate, where you don't have to rely upon luck and defense and all those other elements to get outs from your starting pitchers, which is where the Cardinals were last year, right? We know in the conversations that we've had on this on this YouTube channel, please do subscribe if you enjoy Cardinals content. We're giving it to you all off-season long. YouTube.com slash at Schaefer 12 We've had these conversations where we kind of dialed it up and said, look, the Cardinals had three of the worst strikeout rates in baseball last year uh, in terms of guys that gave them considerable starting innings. Talking about Miles Michaelis, who is back, Adam Wainwright, who is not because he's retired, and Dakota Hudson, who now we know is not back because he was non-tendered on Friday. We will have a full episode of B-Shape Daily that I will record Sunday night, so you'll be able to listen to all my thoughts on the non-tenders of Hudson, of Jake Woodford, of Juan Yepes, and particularly of Andrew Kisner, which was maybe the move that surprised me the most. I'm going to dive full into that in a more full episode of b Shafe Daily that I'll record Sunday night. I'll have it for you Monday morning as long as my voice cooperates. If I sound a little bit gravelly today, it's because I spent Saturday night in Columbia, Missouri, uh, right there at Faroe Field, Mizzou, beating Florida in the weirdest college football game I've ever seen. So I don't have a voice anymore. But we had to get on here and talk Aaron Nola, because it looks like, according to Ken Rosenthal, it is a seven-year, $172 million contract that Aaron Nola will sign with the Philadelphia Phillies. So in terms of what that means for the market and for the St. Louis Cardinals, you're looking at slightly below $25 million on the average annual value. Will other player agents use that as the benchmark, or will they say, look, everybody knows that Aaron Nola could have gotten more money elsewhere so that doesn't necessarily set the market. But I don't think it's bad news that the very first contract that goes off the board, we'd look at the total number, we'd look at the average annual value, and we go, hey, not that bad. I think a lot of people were kind of looking in the neighborhood of eh, six years, $180 million for Aaron Nola. And so it's an additional year to get into that price range at $172 million. So I would say generally good news for the Cardinals, but also I don't know how much of an impact that it's going to have. Um they talk as though Yamamoto, when he is posted, could be somebody that signs rather quickly. And if that's the case, I think he will reset the market on what free agent starters are going to base their contracts off of this winter because I, I suspect he will get more than the $172 million that Aaron Nola gets in the deal with the Phillies today. Katie Wu reading now a tweet from her, a friendly reminder that free agency is a two-way street. And sometimes, though not always, when a team misses out, it's less about the contract terms and more about where a player wants to be. I think that seems to be the consensus when it comes to this situation for Aaron Nola. And again, now that it's happened, it's easier to say this. But looking back on it, we always should have suspected that Philly would have been the place for him to land. That's a contending team that was built upon having those two horses at the top of their rotation and Aaron Nola and Zach Wheeler. And you've had Aaron Nola there for his entire career, and it's gone well. You have made deep playoff pushes in each of the last two seasons. 
You've spent money around the rotation with guys like Trey Turner and Bryce Harper. Like they've got a good thing going in Philly. If you have been happy where you were at your place of employment for years and years and years, and it's time to renegotiate on a contract and you're making all the money you could ever hope to have, and they're taking care of you handsomely. Does it have to be pennies on the dollar compared to what the next offer would be to think about having to move jobs and move cities and work with a whole different cast and crew and get to know a bunch of new people? The comfort of I'm making $172 million and I don't have to go anywhere. I don't have to do anything differently. My life doesn't have to be uprooted. That is probably attractive to a person that is in the spot that Aaron Nola is in where it's not like they've been unsuccessful in Philly, right? They have had a lot of success. Things have gone well. He might have been enamored by the Cardinals. We don't really know. We never really will. But he was clearly enamored by what he could potentially continue to have in Philadelphia. Cardinals strike out on Aaron Nola. My impression is I don't think there's really anything they could have done other than something reckless in terms of contract. And and while it's possible they may need to do something reckless the rest of this offseason, if they continue to to say, ah, we really tried, but the guy didn't want to come here, the guy really wanted us to overpay, if that continues to be a trend and that continues to happen with all of these big names, because you've still got Nola, uh, you've still got Blake Snell, you've still got in maybe the next category, Sonny Gray, Jordan Montgomery. Again, I think if you look at all of the names that are kind of near the top of that that category in pre-agent starting pitching, you can't allow each and every one of them to say, oh, we really thought you were great, but we really just used you to kind of uh, drive the bid up where we're actually going to go play. Eventually, if you're the Cardinals, you have to you have to throw your weight around a little bit and decide we're getting this player. What's it going to take? And the Cardinals maybe aren't that front office that has a lot of experience doing that. And there is some sort of a reckless nature to making that type of decision and doing it because it could go bad on you. If you do it with the wrong player, now not only did you sign the big contract that you're on the hook for, but you probably would admittedly say, yeah, we, we paid more than we ought to have just to make sure we could get the deal done out of a place of desperation. The Cardinals are desperate right now, but they're not desperate enough to have to do something so above and beyond over the top. If the if the guy's getting 170 million and you say, would it would you sign with us for 210? You can do that. And I don't even know if that would have been an option, if that would have been enough to compel Aaron Nola to make a different decision. But even if you decide to go that way and you're the Cardinals, it does hamstring the rest of what you're able to do. And so now you recognize that you've still got all the flexibility that you had at the beginning of the offseason, but there will come a time very soon where you have to put that flexibility into play and maybe use it a little bit by, again, throwing your weight around. If Aaron Nola is making $172 million and Yoshinobu Yamamoto, good old buddies with Lars Nupar, as we talked about in uh, the last podcast, you might just say, hey, this guy can be our Aaron Nola and he's five years younger. Let's go seven-year contract, $210 million. Put it out there. And if that's not enough to get him, what is? Right? Like, this is the time, I think, for the Cardinals to be ready, to re- ready to pounce because you don't want to let the market pass you by. I don't think that's what happened here today. I think that Aaron Nola was always destined to be a Philly, and in retrospect, it probably would have never gone any other way. You let all the teams that are interested in pitching make their pitches to you. You take that back to the Phillies and say, here's what's out there. What can you guys do for us so that we can just continue this relationship that's been profitable and good for both sides? And I think that's what ends up happening. Cardinals fans, what do you think about the news that Aaron Nola is off the board signing a new seven-year contract with the Philadelphia Phillies? Did the Cardinals finish in second place? I don't know. I think it was the Phillies and only the Phillies with any other teams that had an interest, probably um, the bridesmaids in this case, because uh, it was just a situation where it seems Nola wanted to be back in Philadelphia. But how does it make you feel, Cardinals fans? Let me know. Sound off in the YouTube comment section below and stay tuned to the channel and on Spotify and Apple Podcasts as well, as we'll bring you a new B-Shape Daily talking a lot of the off-season machinations, a lot of the non-tender news that we got from the Cardinals earlier this weekend, and just continuing to break down the off-season from a Cardinals perspective all winter long. Thank you guys so much for joining, and we'll talk to you next time. Peace!